Hello guys, I'm Viking Gur Olofsson and my album From Afar is out today. Thank you so much for joining us for this uh, special day. What was your inspiration for From Afar? The inspiration for this album, there are two inspirations. It was a meeting with one of my musical heroes last year, Girgi Kurtak, one of my favorite composers of all time, who at the age of 96 is still writing incredible music for the world in Budapest where he lives. And it, this album is also kind of my looking back at my own childhood and who I am in music, taking music that I've really wanted to record for years and not really found the right way of releasing, bringing back childhood memories, nine different composers, music from Iceland, uh, my guys, Johann Sebastian Bach, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, but also some romantic stuff that I haven't recorded before, Robert Schumann, Johannes Brahms, sort of the core of who I am, my musical DNA, folk songs from Iceland, from Hungary, Bartok, all those things that I love so much. So the idea was to write a letter in the form of an album um, to Kurtak, my hero, to thank him for this amazing time we had in Budapest last year, two or three hours of just playing music and having the most amazing time. Um, and also a letter in the form of an album to you, my audience. Uh, it's called From Afar and that's where I come from, from Iceland. And that's my message to you. Which tracks are tied to specific memories? The whole album goes back one way or another to memories in my childhood. You know, the fact that the album is actually recorded on a grand piano and also the same album is recorded on an upright piano and released simultaneously, um, that's a new thing. I think it's never been done before, but that's my background. I always had a grand piano in the living room, but my mother is a piano teacher, my father a composer. And the piano was very often occupied, and I was complaining about that all the time. And they found a solution, which was to put this beautiful old upright piano into my bedroom, which became, you know, I, I started to love the intimacy of that sound. It became my bedroom music making. Um, so, so that's the first thing. I mean, secondly, there are so many, so many things that connect back to my childhood. Um, for instance, I had a dream of, of uh, playing the violin sonata of Bach. The solo violin sonata, which is for violin, nothing else. C major, the one that is. It goes on and on and on. I love it on the violin. I remember when I heard it when I was eight years old or nine years old. And I just dreamt about this being for the piano. And now, 30 years later, I've actually made that dream come true. Um, made a piano transcription from it. Bartok, uh, of course, Bartok, Hungarian composer. I think a misunderstood composer. I played Bartok once for a student of Bartok's. That was in 2002 when I was 18 years old. And the student, Georgi Sandor, was 91, I think, or two. He was very old, living in New York. And I played for him. And we had this thing with Bartok where he explained to me that Bartok's music is all lightness fantasy, song, and he was lamenting the fact that today so often you hear Bartok on the piano and it's all super percussive and very almost like a pianist is angry. So I chose these Bartok songs for the album that are the most lyrical and most beautiful Bartok pieces I think I know really and genius transcriptions connecting them to music from Iceland, Icelandic folk songs. That's obviously connecting to my past. The Ave Maria, Icelandic Ave Maria is personal favorite. It's an Ave Maria that I think can stand next to the famous Ave Marias of, of Schubert, of, of Bach Kuno, you know, and those Ave Marias. But, but, but that Icelandic Ave Maria, it's a beautiful prayer that doesn't want to, you know, end in a way. It's, it's a melody that sort of takes off and goes in unexpected directions. And I combined it with my favorite Mozart prayer, musical prayer, the Laudate Dominum, which is maybe the longest track on the album for soprano, for choir and chamber orchestra and that's also just a favorite piece from my childhood that I had dreamt about playing on the piano and I wasn't sure if it would fit for ten fingers with all the things chamber orchestra and choir and everything but it works I think <laughs> and that's a music video that will be will be premiering today as well how are grand and upright different in terms of sound and playing I think the grand piano and the upright piano is extremely different instruments, uh, especially the setup that I do on the upright piano. You know, it's almost like the difference between 
the the violin and the viola, if you wish. It's, it's really, it's, of course, they're siblings, but but it's really different instruments. Um, the grand piano, of course, has these gorgeous big vibrations, and everything is on a big scale, and it's it's one of the most beautiful inventions in the history of man, I think. Uh, the upright piano is the opposite. It doesn't have that sound, that body of sound, but it has something else. It has something very private. And when you play the upright piano, you can sometimes feel like you are almost telling a secret to someone. You know, it's the most intimate thing to do. It's house music. It's like music for the for the home. Um, so and for the microphone, because the microphone is very close to to the piano, I, I love it because it, it just gets so delicate, and you can explore very soft palettes on the on the upright piano. What is unique about growing up in Iceland? I think. Uh, the idea of growing up in Iceland is different today than it was when I grew up, really. Uh, I grew up, I'm born in 84, so, uh, you know, I was 10 in 94, 95, 96, when the internet is really starting to come into people's homes, uh, certainly long before Google and, and YouTube and uh, certainly Facebook and all of it. So I think that's a different time. At that point, growing up in Iceland was so simple and beautiful and protected and free and maybe and maybe I'm slightly nostalgic, but I think it's 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 almost a better time, you know. Uh, growing up today in Iceland would be very different. Like my boys, uh, you know, they have the access to the internet. They have the whole world at their feet. That wasn't the case. We didn't have the whole world at our feet. Um, and I had to rely on recordings for a lot of musical oxygen, which is probably why I love that art form so much. I love to record because that's how I got to know so many pieces. Uh, I couldn't go every week to Carnegie Hall or Whitmore Hall or wherever you live. I mean, if you live in a big city, you have those big houses with great arts going on the whole year. Iceland, we had we have a great orchestra, a wonderful orchestra, but we don't have that kind of... We, certainly we didn't have those kinds of people coming all the time. So I had to really rely on my parents' record collection, CD collection. One of the best days in my life was when they trusted me with their LP player. And I could finally operate it myself, you know, with a needle and everything. I remember how scared I was because my father had scared the death out of me. <laughs> but um, but that, 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 that's, that's what it was, you know. We didn't jump on a plane just to go to London to see a BBC prom like people do today. That wasn't an option in the 90s. No one thought like that. We just didn't travel like that. So human behavior has changed so much. So that was unique about growing up. There were no piano competitions. I played football. Um, it was not until I was 18 when I went to Juilliard that I realized that you know, there are really other people also in the world who are really good at playing the piano, <laughs> which was a good, happy discovery, you know, but, but it, was, it was very, very private. What gets you out of bed to continue to be an artist? What gets me out of bed is uh, my sons who wake up before me and wake me up uh, and I have to bring my wife coffee to bed. That's if I'm in Iceland. But I mean, seriously, what gets me out of bed is, is that um, I think we can do better. I think I can do better. I think that we can play music better in general. I think uh, I always had this idea that, that I'm very talented, to be honest, but that I'm a late bloomer. I thought like that since I was 10. Um, and I like that because then you have something somewhere to go, you know, um, you know and, and I think it's a healthy attitude of, of being in a way confident, but also realizing that, that, that there's a long way to go and that, you know, you can improve hugely throughout your whole life. I remember when I heard Horowitz uh, in one interview talk about how he learned his piano technique and got his colors in his 40s. It's very interesting. I'm still in my 30s. You know, so if Horowitz has, has, has had that attitude, I think we must also have that attitude. When or where are you most creative? I think creativity is something you cannot uh, predict and order. It's something that sort of happens and sometimes it happens in surprising moments in your life maybe when you've had a change in your life maybe when you've gone through a difficult period or if you've gone through a happy period i think very often stagnation in life doesn't lead to creativity i think very often for instance when you have something happening in the world whether it's a good thing or a bad thing like the pandemic was a bad thing obviously but i think that led to a lot of creativity and rethinking in, in the arts and, and so in that way that was one of the few good things to come out of it. And I think that's also on a personal level. Um, you know, we, we get so used to being on automatic 
you know, kind of in our busy, busy lives, all of us, that when things shake that up, uh, we can have something new happen to us. But I think also creativity is something you, you can also decide to strive for, you know, because once you are 30, 35, um, it's easier to settle into a smaller and smaller bubble. Um, and I think that we also have to, in a way, put in the investment of time to read books, to to go to museums, to, to go see plays, to keep an open mind for whatever it is that triggers us, architecture, politics, whatever it is, uh, to keep striving to educate and open new doors. Because I think for the majority of us, it's, it's difficult, you know, you get so busy and we're supposed to do everything. We're supposed to go to the gym, we're supposed to be perfect parents, have a great career, we'll cook, cook organic food, preferably no meat, all of it. <laughs> it's, uh, it's not easy, um, but I think that has to be prioritized. So reading literature, for instance, that's a good start. What would you tell uh, to your 15 year old self? 15? One five, oh, not 50. Even younger. Uh, yeah. What would I tell to my 15 year old self? I think uh, I'd say, don't worry, you'll get to play concerts and it'll be fun and it'll be beautiful. Um, I remember when Alfred Brendel, the great pianist, uh, told me back in 2012 when I had no concerts for 10 years ago, almost, I mean, some concerts, but not, nothing close to my life now. And I was from Iceland and nobody was helping me, I felt, and I wasn't doing competitions because I think they're ridiculous. And I, and I was just trying to find my way in the music jungle. And he said to me, he came to our recital and he said, don't worry, you will get where you want. It will take time, but it takes 15 years to become famous overnight. And that's something I might say to with a 15 year old myself. That's how it is very often. You know, it's such a long path, music. And it's only now that in a way I have full control over my life in music. Uh, and I get to do kind of my dream projects and I'm 38. Um, so that's probably something I'd say to my 15 year old self. Do you have any hidden talents? No, I only have one talent. Uh, it's uh, playing the piano. <laughs> What's something you can't live without? Uh, I can't live without music and without my family, certainly my, my wife and my, my sons. Uh, I also can't live without coffee in the morning, you know, um, and there are things like that. I can't live without Johann Sebastian Bach in my life. I, I love him so much and, and Mozart as well. Um, yeah, but I mean, for, for the essentials, I think it's family first, probably Bach second, coffee third. If you weren't a pianist, what would you do? I'd be a doctor if I wasn't a pianist. I'm pretty sure of it. Uh, I'd love that. Uh, one of my best friends is a doctor, a kidney specialist. It's an incredible job, incredibly demanding and uh, selfless, much more selfless than being a pianist. Uh, and it's more service, whatever the artists say, um, to be a doctor, to work long hours in the hospital and to save people's lives and to communicate with people in the most vulnerable moments. That fascinates me. It's a very difficult job, actually. Um, so, but, but I'm sure. My, my grandfather, his name was Vikinger. I have his name. Um, and he was uh, one of the first pediatricians in Iceland. So. I would go with him to the hospital every Christmas, play piano on Christmas Day for the sick children, you know, uh, and some of them who had help would sort of walk around the beautiful Christmas tree and, and then they would, they would have Santa Claus and everything. I think that stayed with me. And he was also a very musical man, so medicine. Is there something that people are surprised about you when they meet you? Um, people are sometimes surprised that I'm a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes they see the, the covers of my albums and they see the kind of images and they're very kind of pristine and very conceptual and very, very sort of serious, you know. Uh, I'm a serious musician, but I'm not necessarily that serious as a person. Um, so sometimes they, they're a little bit afraid of me and then they see that I actually smile and I'm, I'm kind of an idiot. And then <laughs> and that, that, that's probably what they're surprised with. But anyway, um, it's probably time to go into the premiere. Please sit back, enjoy it. Laudate Dominum, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, or Wolfie, as I like to call him. Um, this is my transcription, originally for a soprano, 
a little chamber orchestra and a choir, and it's one of the most beautiful things that Mozart ever wrote. It's a melody that almost doesn't end. It goes on and on. He can't, he can't stop. And I hope you won't stop watching the video. And feel free to then check out the rest of the album, uh, whether on the upright piano or on the fabulous grand piano.